It was on March 6, 1970 that the Nepali Sherpas and the Japanese ski diver Yuichiro Miura decided to climb Mount Everest. But this was not the plot. The twist comes when Miura decides to climb down the Everest by skiing. Yup. Now this seems quite adventurous and dangerous at the same time because climbing down Everest is one thing that is already full of hurdles and skiing down the Everest is totally another thing. So in February 1970, the team from Japan arrived in Kathmandu for the Mount Everest ski expedition. Earlier in the 1960s, Nepal put restrictions on climbers and skiers from climbing any mountains due to some serious dangers and losses. But in the late 60s, the restriction was over and so the Mountaineer Society was overjoyed and resumed their journey to the mountains. And the same happened with the ski expedition team from Japan. The team included mountain climbers, a ski team, photographers, a film crew, and other people from the press. This journey was both a scientific trip and a nerve-wracking ski expedition. They had a lot of gear with them that they needed to get to the Everest Base Camp. And for that, around 800 porters walked for 185 miles for 22 days. Shipments weighing about 30 tons were divided into two parts, 15 tons for airborne transfer and the rest for porter caravan use. They landed at the Namke Bazaar, 3,440 meters, on March 4th, and two days later, on March 6th, they arrived in Thayangboche, 3,867 meters. The team established their first base camp at Thayangboche to allow members to acclimate to the altitude. It was on March 6, 1970 that their trip finally started. They stayed at the base camp for weeks to get used to the air of Everest and to save themselves from possible problems that might occur. The Imja Glacier Group, the Mingbo Glacier Group, and the Kumba Glacier Group were the three divisions of the squad. It was up to the Kumbu Glacier Group to choose the location of our base camp. What these excited and passionate people didn't know was that there were a lot of hurdles coming their way. It was on the 23rd of March that the base camp was erected in the heart of the moraine, directly below the icefall, 5,350 meters. With the previous two scouting trips, five of them had already traveled to the icefall. It was on 4th April that the team was able to set up Camp 1 just above the icefall. Things were dangerous and riskier than ever, but they had no plan to put a stop to their goal. However, on 5th April, Six Sherpas from the Japanese ski expedition were killed by a massive glacier avalanche at 5,700 meters. That was not the end of it, as another accident occurred. On April 9th, at about 8 p.m., one of their icefall porters, Kayak Searing 36, was killed by Sirak Fall at 5,525 meters. Even with extreme caution, it was impossible to counteract the natural force that seemed to be so powerful in the icefall. Because of these mishaps, the team was not only given a rude awakening, but they were also forced to fall behind schedule. As if this wasn't enough, some other members of the expedition felt high altitude sickness. Miura, on the other hand, was also facing a few problems. But apart from that, he was happy to be almost there and live his dream of skiing from Mount Everest. He turned Everest into his little ski resort. Before starting his journey, he was practicing really hard he did a lot of tests with and without a parachute and also rode the undiscovered slopes. He knew he was ready to live his dream real soon, but no one else was sure if the parachute would work at such a height. At one point, Miura thought of giving up as back-to-back -back incidents of his team members dying was really a setback for him, but he kept going because he couldn't leave just like that when he was so close to winning and he didn't want to disrespect the mountaineering community by giving up. It wasn't the first time he was skiing from a mountain, as in 1966, he was the first person to ski down Mount Fuji. There was a lot of material that was still to be loaded, and so to carry out the load to at least 8,000 meters, the mountaineers were divided into two teams. It was the Southwest Face Team and the Southeast Ridge Team. On April 16th, the advanced base camp, Camp 2, was erected at a height of 6,450 meters. On April 17th, the Southwest Face Team constructed the Advanced Base Camp, FABC, at a height of 6,600 meters. Now the two teams began to work, as per their plan, and as they were likely to summit in May, so they had to make their way out. It was on 18th April that Miura and the team established Camp 3 at the Lhotse Face. 
The weather was comparatively better, and they had little trouble finding their way. However, because several of the team members and Sherpas were experiencing altitude sickness, the load-carrying operation was probably going to be postponed. Around 2 p.m. on April 20th, Hirabayashi and Kanzaki fell down the Lhotse face when Hirabayashi was descending. Fortunately, they were shielded by a rock's edge and unhurt. However, this is only a preview of the catastrophe that was ahead. On 21st April, around 9 p.m., a call came from Dr. S. Sumiyoshi, who was staying at Camp 1 with a few more mountaineers. He gave the news that put everyone in extreme shock. He told them that Narita had died of an unexpected heart attack. He told them that he was having his meal and suddenly had a heart attack. It was so sudden that Dr. S. Sumiyoshi and the other mountaineers who were there couldn't do anything. The body was tenderly transported to the base camp on April 24th. It was burned in line with the local religious custom at Tukura. One day's march below base camp in the presence of 11 members before being presented to his father who was waiting in Kathmandu by their commander S. Matsukata. However, at higher levels the team members struggled because just six of our active members remained after 12 others were called up to take Narita's body down. H. Tamura and four other members of the Southwest Face Crew concluded constructing ropes at Camp 3, 7,600 meters on April 28th. Things were getting so bad that members of the expedition decided to call it off for the Southwest Summit and decided to pull all their efforts into completing the Southeast Assault. It was on 6 May 1970 that Miura did a few wide turns on the slopes of the South Col. He became the first person to ski at 26,000 feet. Miura hiked to the start of the long run down the South Col and was all set to go at 11 a.m. after setting up the plan for filming and rescue. From his point of view, he was all set and had taken all the precautions, but things were going to be easy on him. The winds were really strong as they were giving Miura a hint to step back. So with a heavy heart, he planned to stop trying to ski Mount Everest that day. And if he didn't ski that day, it would clearly mean that he would have to wait for another week. But the wind stopped, and at around 1 p.m., he made his way down Everest. He suddenly fell down the rocky and rough blue ice of the coal and quickly opened his parachute. And it did open. Miura was relieved, but only for the time being. As he thought now he would land easily, there raised a lot of turbulence. The wind's direction was changing in seconds, and he was losing the strength to keep himself balanced and calm. As if the worst was meant to happen on this expedition, Miura's parachute failed to function properly, and he soon realized that he was not in charge of the parachute. He was blank and didn't know what to do next, or maybe he clearly knew what was going to happen next. His skis touched the rough ice, and he did everything to slow down, but to no avail. He was coming down at full speed, and nothing was working to get his hands on himself. And suddenly, his ski got stuck on a rock, and he fell. He could feel the cold and harsh ice on his back as he fell down. At that moment, he knew that he wouldn't be able to get back to life. And this was it. But God had other plans for him. He was saved. Yes, he ditched death and came back to life. Miura's skis were held in place by safety straps that kept him from flying as they failed next to him until one broke off and bounced like a toothpick. He tried to hold onto the ice, but he couldn't stop himself from sliding down the most enormous crevice in the world. After flying over a boulder, he was thrown 33 feet into the air. Miraculously, a small patch of snow stopped him by 250 feet from the Berkshund. When he was giving the interview, he said that once he was lying down on the ice, he thought that he was over and was on another planet. But after a minute, he realized that it was a miracle and he was still alive. Whoa, that was really unexpectedly good. A documentary was made on his expedition in which he tells about everything that happened in the air. The documentary is named The Man Who Skied Down Everest. It came out in 1957 and also became the first sports movie to win the Academy Award for Best Documentary. Also wrote a book on his adventurous journey in 1978. This tragedy of almost losing his life didn't make Miura put a stop to his passion for skiing down every mountain on the planet Earth. His life is full of achievements and hard work.